Here we will proceed with the second step in the model development, translation of the conceptual diagram into mathematical equations. The goal is to come up with equations that represent the mass balance or energy balance in the system and are consistent with respect to units. The mass balance equation shows the rate at which the state variable changes as a function of all the flows that enter or leave the state variable. This equation is simply derived from the conceptual diagram. For example, we might have a state variable corresponding to a concentration of some nutrient, expressed in mole per cubic meter. Within the diagram, we might have several fluxes that represent an inflow of the nutrients to the state variable, such as fluxes F1, F2, F3 and F4. Similarly, we might have several fluxes that represent an outflow of the nutrient from the state variable, such as fluxes F5 and F6. If we put this together, the change in the nutrient concentration within a relevant time frame is simply the sum of all inflows minus the sum of all outflows. This is written in the form of a differential equation. Delta n over delta t is equal to f1 plus f2 plus f3 plus f4 minus f5 minus f6. In this equation, the time derivative delta n over delta t represents the rate of change of n and has a unit of mole per cubic meter per second. Clearly, when the model contains multiple state variables, we must formulate the mass balance equation for each state variable. We illustrate this using the lake model we have analyzed before. At this stage, we are not going into detail about the underlying nature of each process, but simply write the mass balances as implied by the conceptual diagram. We recall that the model currency is nitrogen, and in this particular case, each state variable has a unit of moles of nitrogen per cubic meter of water column. For the phytoplankton compartment, we see that the nitrogen concentration increases due to the influx of F1, but decreases due to the efflux of F2 and F8. Similarly, for the zooplankton compartment, the rate of change in the nitrogen concentration is positive due to the influx of F2, but negative due to the efflux of F3, F4 and F5. It is now clear what the results will be for the remaining state variables. For the fish population, the nitrogen concentration increases due to the influx of F5, but decreases due to the efflux of 6 and 7. For the free-floating detritus, the concentration increases due to the influxes 3, 6, 7 and 8, and decreases due to the efflux of 9. And finally, the nitrogen concentration in the ammonia pool increases due to the import fluxes 4 and 9, and decreases due to the export of flux 1. Here we must be careful, because the mass balance of ammonia in the lake is also impacted by the transport into the lake, such as due to the agricultural runoff. Also, export from the lake, for instance by a river that flows out of the lake, needs to be considered. The additional inflow and outflow fluxes, 10 and 11, therefore need to be included in the mass balance equations. Overall, we obtain five differential equations representing the balances of nitrogen in the system, one equation for each state variable. In the next step of the model development, it is important to check whether the equations make sense and truly represent the mass balance in the system. We can do this by realizing that the concentration of the total nitrogen in the entire lake is the sum of the nitrogen concentrations present in each compartment. Therefore, if we sum all the fluxes on the right hand side in the above equations, we obtain the rate of change in the total nitrogen concentration in the lake. For our example, after careful calculation, we obtain delta n total over delta t 
is equal to f10 minus f11. This is indeed what we expect. The net rate of increase in the concentration of total nitrogen in the lake water is given by the difference between the external import and export. Similarly, if the system is fully closed, so the external import and export fluxes are zero, we obtain that the concentration of total nitrogen in the system does not change in time, so the time derivative is zero, as expected. These mass balance checks show us that the model is so far consistent and ready to be further developed. In the last step, we check the units. We recall that in this model, each state variable has a unit of moles of nitrogen per cubic meter. Therefore, the time derivatives have a unit of mole of nitrogen per cubic meter per second. Because the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the mass balance equations are equal, the equations imply that the unit of each flux in the model, including the external import and export fluxes, must be the same, moles of nitrogen per cubic meter per second. We emphasize, however, that it is not always true that the units of each state variable must be the same. For instance, in our simple lake model, it was logical to express the units of the state variables in moles of nitrogen per cubic meter of water. However, if we add sediment compartments, then this unit makes no sense. Instead, sediment compartments are better expressed per surface of sediment. Therefore, we emphasize that it can happen that state variables have different units. In such cases, the check of units will be an absolutely critical step in the model development to verify that the model is consistent. To illustrate this, we will enhance our lake model by adding an extra compartment. We will call this compartment the bottom detritus, and as the name suggests, it corresponds to the detritus at the lake bottom. As mentioned earlier, a logical unit for this state variable is moles of nitrogen per square meter. Therefore, this state variable represents the amount of nitrogen in the sediment column below the sediment water interface. We will consider that the bottom detritus interacts with the compartments in the water column via three processes. First, nitrogen in the bottom detritus increases due to sinking of the free-floating detritus and we can describe the rate of this process with the flux F12. Second, nitrogen in the bottom detritus increases due to sinking and the subsequent death of the phytoplankton. We describe the rate of this process with the flux F13. Finally, Nitrogen in the bottom detritus decreases due to detritus mineralization and the subsequent release of ammonia from the sediment into the water column. We describe the rate of this process with the flux F14. Therefore, the mass balance of the bottom detritus is described by the differential equation shown on the bottom. The sum of fluxes on the right hand side represents the net rate of a process that we call the benthic pelagic coupling. This differential equation is consistent as all fluxes have units of mole of nitrogen per square meter per second, which is also the unit of the time derivative on the left hand side. How do we now implement this benthic pelagic coupling in the rest of our mass balance equations? We cannot simply add or subtract the newly introduced benthic fluxes from the pelagic mass balance equations, as the units are different. We need to find a way how to convert the benthic flux, which is per square meter, into a rate of change in the nitrogen concentration in a pelagic compartment, which is per cubic meter. To do this, we consider that the water column is well mixed. So the nitrogen exchange across the sediment water interface affects the concentrations in the entire water column. Now, let's assume that the sediment in our lake has a surface area of 100 square meter and a total depth of 5 meters. 
This means that the volume of water in the lake is 500 cubic meter. The total amount of ammonia leaving the sediment per second is equal to F14 multiplied by 100 square meter. This amount of ammonia is diluted in a volume of water equal to 500 cubic meters, which means that the concentration change in the water column is equal to F14 times 100 divided by 500. This is equal to F14 divided by 5, where 5 is the water depth in the lake. Thus, we see that the height of the water column must be included when relating the change in the concentration of nitrogen in the pelagic compartment to the flux of nitrogen from the benthic compartment. Taken together, the mass balances for the enhanced lake model are summarized by the six differential equations. To confirm that the equations are correct, we check the overall mass balance and units. When we do this carefully, we find out that the equations are now fully consistent. Now we turn our attention to chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are usually more difficult to depict with a conceptual diagram, as we cannot simply use an arrow in and out of the compartment to make the mass balance equation of this compartment. Instead, we make the mass balances based on the chemical equation itself. We do this in three steps. First, we choose a unit of reaction rate. Let's assume, for instance, that we want to express the rate in moles of D per time. In the second step, we rewrite the stoichiometric coefficients and create a standardized chemical reaction that is consistent with the original chemical equation. The new coefficients will therefore represent the moles of substance consumed or produced per mole of D. Finally, the rate of change in the reactants and products is calculated by multiplying the reaction rate with the corresponding stoichiometric coefficient in the standardized chemical reaction. Note the minus sign for the reactants, indicating that they are removed from the system, and the plus sign for the products, indicating that they are added to the system if the reaction proceeds from left to right as indicated. To illustrate this on an example, Let's consider a chemical reaction describing organic matter mineralization through aerobic respiration. First, organic matter is a chemically complex entity comprising various elements in various quantities. In biochemical models, organic matter is typically represented with a chemical formula containing the most abundant elements, carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus in the so-called Redfield ratio of 106 to 16 to 1. Thus, one mole of the Redfield organic matter is expressed by a chemical formula shown in red. Note that the carbon atom is written as part of the compound CH2O, which corresponds to one-sixth of a glucose molecule and indicates that the oxidation state of carbon in organic matter is zero. Also note that the nitrogen atom is written as part of ammonia and the phosphorus atom is written as part of phosphoric acid. Now, let's assume that the Redfield organic matter is completely mineralized to CO2 using molecular oxygen, O2, as oxidant. The chemical reaction corresponding to this process is written as shown in blue. Note that in addition to the conversion of the carbon from the organic matter form to the inorganic form, ammonia and phosphate are also released. The question now is how do we include this process in our mass balance equations? The answer is simple to find. First, we choose that the rate of the aerobic organic matter degradation will be in the units of moles of organic matter per time. We denote this rate as R. Then, using the concept presented earlier, the contribution of this process to the mass balances of organic matter, oxygen, ammonia, phosphoric acid and CO2 will take the form as shown on the bottom. Note that the rate R is present in all equations 
and the difference for each state variable is determined by the corresponding stoichiometric coefficient in the standardized chemical equation. To conclude this video, we emphasize that any mass balance model will generally consist of two different types of fluxes. One type of fluxes originates from an ecological or chemical process, such as a chemical reaction, nutrient assimilation, grazing, organic matter mineralization, etc., that exchange mass or energy within the system. And the other type of fluxes originate from transport processes that exchange mass or energy between the system and the surroundings. Additionally, we emphasize that we must formulate this mass balance equation for each state variable. Only then will we get a consistent and mass balanced model.